reduced drastically, 25 to 28 percent. Yeah, well, you pay, I mean, you pay both sides of your social security payment, you're paying the employer's side, but you're deducting also the cost of the business. So you're deducting your now let me ask you a question. You're not, you're not paying social security taxes. You don't have to do You want to do there too? We also save some by uh, owning the properties and then rent to We're circulating the sign in. It's optional. I mean, if you don't want to sign in, it's not a requirement. But it might help us get back to anyone we see here and so forth. Do they have a tap? Yes, you give me a tablet.
Good evening, everyone. It's 6 o'clock, and we'll get started. Uh, we want to thank everyone for attending our meeting tonight. Um, just to briefly highlight two other um, groups of money that we received and what had transpired over there before we get into our ARPA funds. Um, the last two years have, have resulted in a lot of federal monies being allocated and being spent throughout our nation. And uh, the county received $10.2 million in CARES funds. Uh, through those monies that we received, through the help of planning and, and uh, CEDACOG, uh, through their guidance, uh, we received um, applications to assist uh, many businesses and, and uh, entities throughout our county. We were able to assist 350 businesses, 43 nonprofits, and every school district received $200 per child to uh, help uh, maintain and keep the kids in school or prepare um, for the, the pandemic to get them back into school. Um, that resulted in $3.1 million for the school districts out of that 10.2. Um, that's what we did with the CARES money. We have about 1. Point, I think 1.6 still in the county general uh, regarding those funds that we can still utilize for, for county projects. Uh, then we received monies through what they call the ERPA program, the ERAP program. Uh, we utilized that and, and uh, we partnered with STEP to help uh, landlords and utility companies uh, to keep people in their homes. And uh, to date they have allocated about $8 million of those monies to keep the landlords uh, paid and the utility companies up to date. Uh, they're on the second batch of their monies um, regarding that. The reason why you're here tonight is because of the uh, a, the uh, ARPA program, the American Rescue Plan, and um, we prepared a short um, presentation, a PowerPoint presentation. Um, so um, I'll have the director open up about the allowable uses for the ARPA funds. Uh, we had to wait for direction from the U.S. Treasury on how to utilize these funds because everything from the CARES monies to the ERAP monies to these monies are all being audited. We want to make sure they're, they're allowable expenses and everything's being spent appropriately. So we had to wait for the, uh, the uh, general uses. Now what we did is the county will be receiving $22 million. Uh, we received $11 million last May in the first allocation. The second allocation will be this May. We'll receive another 11 million, so we have 22 million um, to utilize. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you want to go to the first slide presentation, the director <coughs> will explain the general allowable use. Um, so, the, the uh, federal government has given us some rules, and these are general in nature. Uh, there's some more specifics to them, uh, but generally, we can spend the money to support public health response to uh, COVID, to address the negative economic impacts uh, <coughs> that COVID has caused, uh, to replace public sector revenue loss, premium pay for essential workers, uh, be that first responders, uh, hospital personnel, uh, and some of our county personnel fit into that category and also water, sewer, broadband infrastructure. Um, while they are allowable ARP usage, uses, uh, there are other infrastructure dollars that are anticipated beyond ARP, uh, and there are separate uh, broadband funds available through ARP. So we, what we don't want to do is focus all of our county attention on broadband, but look at the other ARP funds that are available for that. Uh, the four primary entities that were, would generally be el eligible are municipalities, public authorities, so water, sewer, um, nonprofits, 501c3s, and then privately owned businesses. So going forward, uh, the monies have to be 
allocated by 2024 and spent by 2026. And uh, the three commissioners, we sat and we discussed a strategic plan to go about utilizing and spending these monies. We all agreed that the, these, these uh, monies would have to be spent on projects that would be generational, things that would make a big impact in our communities, things that, that would help large populations at the same time would be a generational impact. Uh, these are monies that are going to have to be paid back by our grandchildren and our children. So we want to make sure that they are beneficial for our, our communities. So we initially <coughs> met with the city last June. We talked with the city, we support, and we asked them what their needs were, what they were looking at spending theirs on. And they were in the same now the stages that we were and what we were going to spend our monies on and they had some ideas and we said we'd meet back with them at a later date. Uh, then in July and August we had three nights of meetings with our townships and our, our boroughs to listen to what their needs were because they're receiving our monies also, small amounts, but how we could partner in some of, maybe some of those projects and how we could help them and at the same time we could utilize our monies. And uh, that was very beneficial, hearing from those, those supervisors and those council people and members of those communities. <coughs> then in the late fall, we started to meet with the water and sewer entities throughout the county and uh, big projects, you know, the water and sewer. For instance, Jersey Shore. Jersey Shore's water is, is a 108 years old system. They still use wood filters. <laughs> uh, that services 7,000 people and what they're facing in the future. And they have businesses going in, into their community, making it grow in, in the school districts and, and how we can help these different townships and boroughs. And so we talked with the Water and Sewer Authority. We informed them that we were gonna be talking to the developers and realtors next. And they thought that was a great idea. When you get done talking to them, can you set up a meeting with all of us? And get us all in the same, same room. So we'd be glad to. So as we started meeting with the developers and the realtors, uh, we learned that there's a housing shortage in Lycoming County. Normally there's 600 houses on the market. On the average right now, it's about 175. So we have businesses coming into our area. We have a new one over on the, uh, the farm across the landfill that's gonna bring 150 jobs. They're gonna be opening the first week of May. We've talked to other businesses that are expanding throughout Lycoming County, and people are moving here and they're looking for homes. And they're looking for all types of homes. They're looking for newer homes, they're looking for um, some of the older haves, homes to rehab, and uh, so we had, to, we had to tackle that that crisis too. That's part of the infrastructure. Uh, then we had the housing and water people meet, meet together. And uh, out of that came a task force. And a small task force they developed some ideas to bring back to the commissioners. And they gave us a, a great little plan that we're gonna be looking at and with the planning department going forward. Uh, so that's what we've done up till tonight. We thought we wanna reach out to the public. Uh, these are everybody's monies. We wanna hear from the public and hear uh, whether they think we're on the right track, get their feedback. Um, <coughs> we did that CCAP last week, which is the County Commissioners Association of Pennsylvania that had their spring conference. They had one of their breakout sessions was how to spend your ARPA monies. And uh, we were pleased to find out we're kind of ahead of the curve. There was counties that were listening to us on how we developed this plan and they were like, they were, wow, that's pretty good. Some of them haven't even started yet. So they were very impressed to hear what we've done so far with the last nine months and how we're going forward. And so we have two more meetings that we want to set up and we had them set up for April 12th. From 2.30 to 4 o'clock that day, we'll be speaking to our early childhood um, entities throughout the county because one thing we've, just, we've, we've learned is that uh, employers are having a hard time getting their employees to come back with children. They can't find adequate daycare. They have a parent staying home now taking care of the children because they can't find that daycare that they once had. So that, that's a, a small crisis also that's starting to develop. Uh, and then also that evening we'll be speaking to our farmers at 6 o'clock. Uh, farmers make up a large part of our county, they're crucial. Uh, they're being faced with uh, prices that are going through the roof. Their fertilizer alone is, 
is going to be extremely costly this year in ways we may be able to help the farmers. Um, so that's what we'll be doing next. So <coughs> over the last uh, numerous months, and I'll turn this over to Shannon Rossman, the head of our department, and John Lavelle, the deputy. Uh, they can explain the application process and the requests that have come into the county over the last uh, several months. Let me just, a couple of comments on, on this. On the generational perspective that we have described, I think it's important every person who comes to the county with a request has a different perspective on the definition of what generational means. And some people may not see a vision that other people see. I think it's important that if you are looking for something that you see as generational, to find a way to explain how the allocation of funds in that category would change the nature of the community whether it's in terms of jobs. I mean, essentially, the developers are looking for support in building new housing, right? That's easy to see how building new housing frees up older housing and also is open to people who may not be interested in buying a home that's 100 years old and, that's, and can afford something more, right? But there's other things about generational. I mean, for example, I see folks here from the Arts Council tonight, right? So. There's visions about how arts in a community can change the direction of the community, the people who are attracted to the community. I think it's important to try to educate the commissioners on that because that is something that from the perspective of the people who are very concerned about the development of arts, and there's lots of books that we've been given that I've read some of the uh, books that you've given us on the arts and so forth, how it can transform communities. Um, the other, the other part on the early learning, just so that people understand, this isn't about, it's, it's partly about what Commissioner Metzger said in terms of getting people back to the workforce, right? Because you know from national statistics that a lot of uh, primary caregivers who are primarily women left the workforce during the pandemic and many of them, uh, many childcare centers had to close. But the other component of it is building a workforce in our community. Population retention and population loss are the two biggest challenges we face as a community. Population's gone from 120,000 to 113,000 in the last 20 years. That means that a lot of people who were in the workforce are no longer in the workforce. I mean, some of them by choice because they're baby boomers who are retiring or may retire in a year or so. Some of it by the fact that um, they're not coming here the families are not moving here with the young kids who would be part of the workforce. So part of our drive for this generational perspective is how do we set ourselves up to be a county that experiences population growth in the next decade? And part of that is taking the kids who are here now. Early learning is not babysitting, right? We asked, the commissioners asked the early learning community to educate us on the quality and quantity of early learning centers in the county. And it was quite eye-opening what they shared with us at one of the public meetings, and you can go online and, and see it, and it was coordinated by STEP in the BLAST unit that oversees early learning. There's, it's, called, it's, an away, it's a desert of early learning. In other words, there aren't enough centers, high-quality centers. Right? There are waiting lists to get kids there. And then also, what they also educated about us about is that the, the, um, in the last 20 years, the amount of research that's been done on the brain, the development of the brain, and how much between birth and age five a child's brain develops. And I would ask anyone here if they know. Commissioner was there? Oh, yes. You know. Yes. What was the answer? Six. No, it was like 80% of it, wasn't oh. it? it was, it was, um, it was 90% by, by age five. By age of five. Right. Age of you had said it at the meeting, that's yeah. right. But 90% by the age of five. So what, what we're talking about is really trying to build a workforce from the ground up in our own community. Yes, we want to try to attract people to move here. But 15 years goes by in a blink of an eye, and those kids are ready and graduating from high school, right? And so you want to have them be able to get out and, and work. So. Those are some things to think about in terms of that, uh, some of these categories. And in terms of what you think your request for funds from the commissioners could do to transform the community. Jim? The fourth slide. I'll come around so you can actually see. 
And if you can explain the application process, how? Sure. I'm going to let John, do you want to come up too? You can explain the application process. Go to the next slide. You want to just get <coughs> a summary on the, okay. the left there? Yeah. Um, so, right now, uh, what we have for applications when we're looking at totals, we actually have 54.6 million in requests from outside entities. Uh, remember, we have $22 million available. We have 54.6 million in requests from outside entities, um, which Commissioner Metzger uh, listed the types that were eligible to apply. We also have, from within the county, we have 24.7 million in departmental requests. Now, obviously, things have to be reviewed, categorized, determine their eligibility, and also prioritized. But currently, we have over $79 million in requests for this $22 million worth of funding. Um, and one of the other things, too, is I just wanted to clarify what Commissioner Metzger said about the CARES Act fund. The commissioners have not allocated the remaining portion of that fund, but it actually has been spent. Because the way that the CARES Act fund worked was there were certain requirements of who it could go to, and the commissioners gave out a lot of money for, for grants um, to those different entities. You had to spend it by December 31st. Um, and so what happened was it was a such a short period of time to get those funds out. In order to spend it, we were allowed to spend it on certain types of costs at the county level that was associated with um, personnel time that was pandemic related. So in order to secure that funding and not give any money back to the federal government, we took the remaining amount that was left in those funds and and put in for the personnel time. But the commissioners, unlike some counties, which then just put that in their general fund and used it to supplement the general fund, the commissioners have kept track of how much that money is. So if they see something that they think is worthwhile, they will use that funding for that specific project in the future. Um, but we actually, when you look at it, it is technically already spent. Um, so it's <coughs> not, um, and there will be some opportunity potentially, depending upon all these projects that we've received, um, for that in the future. We're not sure. Okay, this is just a first look. Um, these pie charts represent the total cost of all the projects applied for. Not just what they've asked for, but what their project totals are. So, I mean, you're looking at, at I think, almost well over $100 million when you're looking at the, the entities that have applied for projects. Um, and I'm going to let John go over how we did the pre-application process. So, so um, obviously, when, when you, uh, I guess, just starting from square one, $22 million at that point looks like a lot of money. Um, so the commissioners wanted to basically determine what the community need was uh, to uh, come up with some priorities, um, see, make sure that we're not missing any you know, sectors of the community that, that might have need that, that so far that we're not aware of. Um, and what we've done is we, we had an uh, internet-based uh, pre-grant application to basically give us that picture. Uh, <coughs> turned out to get a uh, pretty darn good um, application rate at 119 that's pretty impressive you know given my experience for the last 15 years being here um, and then also for the need at, at over 50 54.6 50, 50, million 54.6 <coughs> million um, between water and sewer authorities municipalities nonprofits you name it um, quite quite an impressive array of, of uh, projects um, um, so, some of the things that we wanted to do, kind of coming out of, of the pre-grant application process, is to uh, identify, again, community need, identify ways to fund it. Obviously, once you figure out <coughs> what the community need is, and it's, it's, it far exceeds what our grant allotment is, we need to figure out ways to uh, potentially leverage funds uh, with other grant programs that are coming out at the federal level. Um, and state level. And state level. Um, and also um, 
trying to think here? Well, we use two of our consulting firms because one of the things with the commissioners, we want to, you know, we've identified with them that we need to, to make sure that we are maximizing our funding. So if there is an opportunity for a grant at the federal or state level, and um, there is a good chance one of the entities could get that grant if we provided the match. So rather than funding an entire project through ARPA, what if we helped them apply for a grant, or what if we provided the match for that grant? So um, the consultant firm that helped start with um, our pie charts here, they're looking at state funding options, and we've asked them to go through our listing. They've identified uh, probably 50 or 60 different uh, uh, projects that were applied for that would also be beneficial to go for a state grant. Now, obviously not everybody's gonna be able to get a state grant, but we wanna see who is ready to apply and would that work with the time frames for those state grants. Um, we've also asked our federal, our federal consultant that works with us at the federal level to do the same thing. So, um, so we're getting the feedback from them now and John is working on, on what we'll recommend to the commissioners for the first possible round of, of applications. So John's working with, um, we're using CEDACOG as, as a helpful administrator for these grants because any money coming from the feds requires a lot of strings and requires a lot of administrative oversight and will be audited and will be, you know, they don't give anything out for free. It's not free money, it, it's, it's got a lot of strings with it, so. so yeah, going forward, we'll be doing a little bit more detailed analysis of all the grant or pre-grant applications and uh, constructing an actual more in-depth grant application that we'll be sending out to uh, uh, prospective applicants. And, and that's, you know, within the pool of, of projects that we've already had. Um, that'll help us drill down into, you know, time frame, project readiness, um, of some other things, and, you know, the environmental permits, say if it's in uh, infrastructure projects, where they're at with that. Um, because, I mean, the expectation is this money is spent within a, a relatively short period of time. Yeah. So we need to. This is better than the CARES Act fund was because I think we have basically six months to spend that money. Oh, that's quick. But when you're looking at some of the types of projects that we're seeing, water, sewer, certain infrastructure projects, construction projects, there's a lot of permitting involved in that. And if you don't have your design ready, or if you, you um, don't have any of those permits already in place, even though we don't have to spend the money until, by, the project doesn't have to be completed until 2026, the issue is more along the lines is, can you complete the project by 2026? Because in some cases, some of these projects are pretty large and we, we have to see whether or not they can do it because it can be the top priority project, but if they can't complete it by 2026, we can't fund it, so. Okay. Can, can you, John, can you clarify the 24.7 million that's been requested, is it requested from Lycoming County government or yeah. all yeah. those are the <coughs> No, those, those are the department requests. Um, the 54.6 million is, is outside the county correct. government. Okay. That's. But the 24.7 is just. Just county, county departments. County. Those are needs expressed by each department. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, and not not necessarily all those needs may be eligible. We're 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 coming through that list now. Um, but yeah. We, we gathered the requests or the requirements because um, I don't know that you can say every request is truly a requirement. Um, and so as we move forward, I think you've heard a bunch of different categories and allowable uses and things like uh, generational. Um, so the thought is to further define what the evaluation criteria is for all of these uh, requirements slash requests and be able to um, give them a grade uh, completely objectively, <coughs> scoring measures. Uh, present that information to the commissioners because at the end of the day you know we, we take a look at each one of these requests as a as it's an investment in the community so how do we determine what that return on investment is um, from and, I just wanted to as, as you're talking about that 
uh, when, when you when you look at this, I mean, obviously the impetus for, for figuring out what the community needs, what the county need is, um, it, it is the ARPA uh, funding. But as, as a community development um, focused, well, basically as, as the planning department focus and mission, you know, we're, we're looking at uh, projects that we can pursue, you know, beyond ARPA funds, things that we can seek grants for in the future to try to help projects. Um, uh, again, outside of, of just this scope. Yeah, if we had somebody call us and say, oh, you know, I've got this project, and it sounds like a really good project, but we weren't sure it was going to fit into the ARPA time frame or fit into the ARPA eligibility, we asked them to still submit it because we want to have a, a more comprehensive list of the community needs because there are potential other opportunities for funding. You know, whether it's something with Act 13 or something that we could maybe help them. We actually had a number of people put in for some, a small mini grant, Act 13 Legacy Fund, and also submitted for ARPA funds. And our planning staff is actually working with them on a grant application for a park and rec grant. So, because it was a really good project and we thought they had a good chance of possibly getting funding. So, so we're looking at this more holistically in if we can't help them with ARPA, can we help them attain results through somewhere else? Whether it's just helping planning-wise, helping grant-wise, helping <coughs> whatever. Part of the thought process is uh, many of you are probably familiar with uh, the Commissioner's strategy on utilizing Act 13 funds. And so we try to leverage Act 13 in a particular project. And let's just use an example like the airport. I think if we we leveraged thir uh, $3 million of Act 13 uh, in the entire project, but at the end of the day, that brought in $16 million, roughly. Mm -hmm. So the idea is, how do we get the most bang for the buck out of these dollars? And, and one, of the, one of the issues we ran into CARES funding, and we're gonna run into in this way too, which is why it's beneficial that the commissioners were able to to um, put in for the revenue loss and some of the other things is um, fire departments and EMS and stuff like that, not all of our fire departments are 501c3s. Mm -hmm. So not all of them are eligible for this funding. They might be a nonprofit, but they've kind of shanghaied us into it's only eligible to go to a 501c3. Mm -hmm. So we ran into that with the CARES fund. Now the commissioners have used some of their CARES Act money that was left over to go to other fire departments that were not eligible as a 501c3. So some of that money has been given to those departments and some of that may have to occur here depending upon who has requested the funds um, if they are determined to be a prioritized project. So I mean, right there is an issue that we've seen and we've asked that question. We don't know why they did that because mm -hmm. Across Pennsylvania, that's a major issue. Yeah. A lot of fire companies are not 501c3s. Right. So, so, you know, uh, I have an engagement to be at at 7 o'clock, so I have to leave here at 10 of and, and, you know, we've given them 30 minutes of what we're doing, and I, I want to hear what they have to say yeah, as sure. much as I can. Yeah. So, Just real, real briefly, the last, the last slide we have is we've, we've broken this down into now categories where we'll have all those requests put into these different categories and those are economic development the public works which is the water and sewer the recreation the other miscellaneous education agricultural and public safety and then lastly the fiscal relief the county will be coming and we'll put those different requests in each one of those categories as we make our decision but to uh, better assure that the community needs to be addressed, the commissions are broken down into those big categories. So, um, yes, due to our short time frame, this commissioner, we'd like to hear from any of you now. And that doesn't mean it ends at seven. I, I, I just have to leave. Yes, Tom. I'll go first, I guess. Um, uh, you know, I've met with you earlier, but. Uh, I just think somehow we could, could you kind of we're live streaming. I'm sorry, <coughs> so uh, we have this on, on live live feed right now. So you come up, please, and just state your name and thank you very much. Thanks for the Should have known better. <laughs> um, Tom Adams, Williamsport. Uh, 
I, I see a need for to really reach in and help our farmers as best we can. Um, and somehow maybe use that natural gas if it's if we kind of I don't know what it would take to maybe have a fertilizer plant put in the county. I don't know what that cost would be. Get investors to maybe put into that instead of relying on the foreign entities to <coughs> supply that. Because I know I've already heard some about at least one or two farmers saying they might not be able to farm next year because of the cost of the fertilizer tripling already. Uh, and other ways to maybe use natural gas that we do have <coughs> in the county to uh, increase maybe a production of, of possibly going to natural gas vehicles. I don't know what that involves, like going from a gasoline engine to a natural gas engine. I don't know what, what all is involved, but uh, I think it can be done. But uh, there's just a couple ideas um, in that area. Um, and possibly maybe even uh, dredging the river bottom for, for fertilizer use. See what that see what that soil is like underneath if there's any harmful chemicals in it, but hopefully not. Maybe a couple things. Thank That's you. how you know RBT has moved forward with natural gas and, and some of their fleets. So that kind of process is moving forward. Thanks, Tom. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you very much. My name is Joy Walls. I'm with Light Coming Arts, and this is Judy Alinsky with Light Coming Arts also. We're a nonprofit organization that was established way back in 1960. Um, we've supported the arts in Williamsport and Lycoming County through various arts experiences, art shows, arts festivals, and public art. And as you walk through downtown Williamsport, you see a lot of the public art that we have been able to bring to the community. Um, our mission is to generate awareness and opportunities and support the arts. We have found that our business model um, can, can enhance the community through the development <coughs> of cultural tourism. And when we look at other counties and when we look at um, Pennsylvania Wilds, what um, money it has generated for the community, you know, like Coming Arts you know, contributes to that in a small way. But we're at the point where we need to do more with that and expand on that. The County Comprehensive Plan and the Heart of Williamsport Community Engagement Plan cited like Coming Arts, a cultural district and cultural trails as economic and community development assets. And we're to the point where our organization can do more to develop cultural districts and cultural trails. We're at the point where our organization um, is ready to grow. We just need a little bit of a um, incentive to help us uh, you know, over the hump because right now we are a volunteer organization and we're moving. We have plans already for cultural trails and cultural districts to implement. The, um, the funding for like coming arts staff um, will diversify our tourism and ensure the maximum <coughs> community and economic development of the arts and also our historic and cultural assets. According to the Americans for the Arts, we have added over $1.7 billion to Pennsylvania's economy. And that same year, in 2015, Pennsylvania generated $1.3 billion and added $4.2 million to the economy of the northern tier. 
also through branding of arts as the cultural center of the northern tier. The arts can add to Williamsport's economy and economic visibility. Can I ask you a question? Yes. You mentioned the cultural trails. Would they go throughout Lake Lincoln County? Because you're, you're talking initially about just Williamsport. And you're the county. Throughout the, the county, the cultural Absolutely. trails will go throughout the county. Absolutely. Okay. Good. In actuality, Public Artworks has been working out throughout the county for the last 15 years. We've put two pieces of art in the airport. We've put a piece of art up on the Riverwalk also, in addition to what we have done in the downtown. And the cultural trail, the one that we've worked on over the years, is to do a public art walk, a walking tour of the downtown. But um, future cultural trails could be the Underground Railroad. We have a fabulous story. They have um, a replica of the boats that they took the slaves up the river on out in Muncie. So there's a lot of possibilities. And one of the things in a county as big and as wide as ours is that things are in odd little places. But um, you know the historic things, the things that tell the story of the people. But the thing with, that the arts can do is we can fill in those gaps so that it becomes a tourist attraction. And tourism, 80% of every tourist, I mean, uh, what was it? 80% uh, of tourist dollars, part of it is spent on a culture. culture. And we are so in a position, for the last 20 years, we have worked on creating the Art Town brand. And as Joy said, we've been, you know, the County Comprehensive Plan in the heart of Williamsport, and the, the people have wanted this. And we've developed a program that utilizes all this information in what is now currently recognized as the national by the National Governors Association <coughs> as absolutely the best practices in rural areas to generate prosperity. Um, and we have more evidence about that. And then, luckily, over in uh, that row right there is Mr. Jerry Walls, who is <laughs> the guy behind the Susquehanna Greenways. And for the last 25 years, we have also worked with Mr. Walls because a town that is an art town is also a river town and a trail town. So it's like we brand ourselves as an art town, but then that opens all these other portals of cultural tourism to us. So um, we belong in the category. I was looking at the categories there. Because when you talk about the arts, everyone thinks it's sort of a fun, feel-good thing, which it is. And that's one of the wonderful parts of it. But we come under the category of economic development. If you look at rural prosperity through the arts and um, the creative sector, it can bring in a lot of money. But you need a, we need a professional person to do that. You don't get the consistency a performance from a volunteer staff that you would get if we had one pro. And God bless, we have such dedicated um, <laughs> volunteers. I mean, everybody else is struggling to get volunteers, and if we had a staff person to manage them, we could get them. And talk about your kids. Um, everything that we do that creates a better life for these children and is educational for them. Both of us are old teachers, or used to be teachers. <laughs> so another question for you, with the city having $26 million in ARPA funds, have you approached them about their ARPA funds and utilizing them, and if they uh, said they're going to give you any? They have not said. Have you, have you met with them? We have met with okay, them. Okay, great. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. And one of the concerns of the city uh, with sustainability, and um, I, I, well, it even says this in, in the comprehensive plan, that one of the best ways to do this would be to get partially, partially funded by the hotel tax. But um, also in the comprehensive plan, your planners suggested that we write a business plan, which, you know, on top of everything else we had to do, which, but doing the American Rescue Plan work, we did that. We started the development of a business plan. And we realized as we were doing that, with the having a professional uh, director, we could develop our program to a point where after the two years that you invested in us, we think we could manage it ourselves. I mean, you're gonna get more bang for your buck if you put some hotel money in it, because it is tourism. But we think we can do it. We can show you the numbers. So I think if you look at the categories here, one of the, if you read the policy statement behind the ARPA funds, one of the goals was to enhance outdoor recreation because there was uh, an understanding that as a result of the COVID um, uh, pandemic that people were outdoors. Part of the goal behind the ARPA funds was to create resiliency in communities so that when there is another pandemic, which there probably will be, 
it may not be this year but certainly maybe even within our lifetime just simply due to the way the world is getting smaller and smaller right we see that with the spotted lantern fly that the commissioner's got a poster here um, and it's 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 a real issue but um, so I think that it would also hit the category of recreation you know I think that one of the important things about what you're saying today is that we we're responsible for due shares for the pension fund for the county and one of the policies we pursue is diversification we are highly highly diversified and I think that one of the lessons we need to take from that experience is that we need to be highly diversified in our economic development we cannot put all our eggs in one basket you know we can be a recreation place for little league and so forth but that's not everybody not every family is going to travel to Williamsport for uh, little league not every family is going to come here to see art not every family is going to come here to see trails to do trails but the point is some will come for trails some will come for art some will come for little league some will come for the river and that is the goal if we want to repopulate this town and and I I just I think that what you folks have done is fantastic there is example after example in those books that you gave us of little communities that have seen tremendous growth I know it from having lived in New Hampshire and in Maine Portland Maine you know small communities up and down the east which are and the same thing in Virginia so I I hope that you will present something to us because I think it is really the time has come for us to really embrace and move in a positive direction with this well I wish we could claim that we were being innovative but I think if you look at this especially uh, well no this hundred vessel art towns in America what we're talking about is happening all across America right. and not only is it creating economic development it's having a real impact on the quality of life in America and this feeling like the last I don't know how many years it's almost <coughs> like we're down for the count in America we're not down for the count we're rebuilding we're changing and we're developing and adapting the way you talked about it and when you talk about generational this is generational it's changing. Um, yes it's changing yes Yes, and um, one of the things that I love the best about that rural prosperity through the arts, when you build trails, you build cultural districts, you build an art town, what you generate are small businesses. You generate wineries, you generate restaurants, you generate bars, you generate uh, shops that sell clothes, pe shops where people make clay. So you're creating, like over the last 50 years, I've watched the chains take away our hardware stores, our office furniture stores, all of those, but there's still these artisan activities that are left to us as a people, and you can see the entrepreneurial spirit in America. It is just amazing, and the arts has created a new opportunity for that to happen. So. Thank you, ladies. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you very you much. And we do have their application. Great. <coughs> Thank you very much. Commissioners and staff, my name is Dwayne Hirschberg and I'm with Habitat for Humanity and I've watched the, um, the ARPA fund story sort of unfold and while I would have been delighted a few months ago if I would have just received a check, it's been gratifying to watch the, the thoughtfulness and the strategy that you're bringing to this and looking at the comprehensive picture of the needs, not only that but how you can leverage use this to leverage other funds and make sure that these funds that we're getting through the ARPA uh, system um, are not just duplicating funds that you could have gotten elsewhere. So thank you for your good hard work on that. And I've also been in conversation with the city and I'm seeing the same thing there in the thoughtfulness that they're bringing and hearing public thoughts. So I, I'm grateful for the leaders that we have. So Habitat for Humanity, we've been around since 1990 and have completed uh, about 41 homes. All of the homes so far have been in the city of Williamsport and I'm also having this conversation with the city about funding. Um, the sustainability, the return on investment. So when Habitat builds a home and sells it to a homeowner because it's not a giveaway program, the homeowner pays not the full price for the house because we build this at no profit and no interest and we hold a mortgage that's affordable to someone who's making twenty five thousand dollars a year our last homeowner 
uh, with a 30-year mortgage, and in 30 years, she will own a home, and it will probably be the first time in that family's history that they have an estate to pass on to the children, and it's a, it's a pretty remarkable thing. They also pay taxes. I did a calculation, and I think that the homes that Habitat has built in, um, in, the, in Lycoming County and in the city generate about $100,000 a year in property taxes. So it comes back. And I think that the, the request that I will be submitting, my calculation is the rate of return on the investment that, that I'll be requesting is a bit between 12 and 15 years of the tax money coming back. And then after that, it will be just new tax money that's generated um, in, not perpetuity, but for a long time. And um, one of the priorities, as I saw in the original policy that came out, was affordable housing as a use for, um, for the <coughs> ARPA funds. And that falls also in the economic development uh, piece for, for the homeowners. So um, I thank you for your consideration. And we're looking at um, several homes over in the south side uh, that we expect to get title to within a few months. And we're also looking at a couple of vacant lots here in the city for future building. And I'm in conversation with uh, Skip and the other folks in the, with the city about access to those properties. So I thank you for your consideration and, um, and hope that we can build homes where people live and work and become all that they're intended to be in Lycoming County. Great, thank, thank you. you. You know, just to jump off something you said. The commissioners have really looked at the fact that when we build new housing and we expand the tax base, we lessen the tax burden on the existing taxpayers, right? A hundred people paying taxes is less of a burden than 80 people. So, so I'm glad you pointed out to us that those Habitat homes are returning tax dollars. And when we put a family into a home, it also creates a space for someone else in whatever housing that they're coming from. Right. It may not be the greatest housing, but then often you have somebody coming out of homelessness or a halfway house or a shelter that moves into that space while they're getting their life back together and then at some point maybe become um, um, rent a property or maybe become homeowners themselves. So it's a whole continuum that we're on. So thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. How you doing? Good. Kurt Ulmer. Um, I would like to see some of these monies spent on a proper facility and uh, equipment for an office that's right there at the top of probably being affected the most by COVID, and that would be the coroner's office. Um, he's been fighting for a long time for a proper facility and tools, and I don't know if any of you have ever gone along with him, but if you have not, you need to see what the, that office goes through. Um, I know what that office makes money-wise, salary-wise, and uh, they're not doing it for the money. They're doing it because they're true public servants. So uh, as a taxpayer of Lycoming County, I would like to see some of the funds go toward that office. Thank you, Kurt. Thank we, you. We have been working on the coroner's office for the past, decade. well, for a decade for you gentlemen, but we've been working on a building for the past uh, roughly 16, 17 months trying to acquire a building that would not only just service the coroner, but would also take care of other county needs, which would be um, the Magistrate Fry's office, who would currently lease a office in the city of Williamsport. It would move him back up into his traditional Newberry area that he came <coughs> from, which the courts prefer, and then also moving supervised bail into the same facility uh, along with the central processing in the DUI center. And by having all those entities in there, it services those populations. I think you should utilize the same holding cells uh, for that. Um, with, with supervised bill, you could help do the 24 7 operation. You could reduce the population also of the prison by having the bill agents right there along with um, the central processing. And at the same time, we can expand upstairs into record retention for future record, record, tape, record retention. So we've been working on this building for quite some time. Um, we should have a decision on that, um, I would, we would hope, within the next six weeks. 
Um, we've had some setbacks on that, but as we move forward, then we'll know for sure whether we're going to utilize this building for all those entities or we're just going to go in a different direction just for the corner. But you are absolutely right. The corner needs a home, and uh, it has to be at the top of the, the agenda. You know, the as I said earlier, part of the policy of the ARPA funds is to build resiliency and the, that coroner's place, a morgue, is necessary in the event of another pandemic, as well as the other crisis, which is the opioid crisis that they've had to struggle through as first-line uh, responders on all the overdoses. And we kind of that kind of got put to the back when the pandemic hit, but it's still there, and there's still people, you know, ODing. So yeah, we hope to. I, I think it's fair to say that all three of us are committed to trying to find a solution. And the evidence that we're committed is that we've been working on this building, grinding through some uh, misunderstandings and mis, uh, misunderstandings with the owner of the building, but we're grinding through trying to get to the other side of it. I mean, we have to do things by statute, which means that we have to have appraisals, we have to have, that protect the taxpayers. We can't just go out and buy a building. But, so that's what we're waiting on. And then no one's been affected more the pandemic than that office. They have seen it first yeah. and every day. Yeah. So we appreciate deeply what they've done. Okay. Anybody else? Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, Jack. Um, <clears throat> I don't have a wish list. I just some comments I guess or I you should introduce yourself uh, Jack McKernan uh, from William Sport okay. Thank you. Uh, the le I think the levy should be a very high priority and it, it probably is, is. It is. Um, I'm assuming that uh, uh, John that the planning department's using and I've it escapes me now but the 10-year uh, plan that laid out the strategic plan for future development. The comprehensive there must the comprehensive plan. plan. There, okay. Um, and uh, Commissioner Metzger, you, you mentioned uh, the broadband. I, I know, you know, that was something that's kind of in the works. But I have to think now with the remote access being such a big thing for almost everybody's lives that. Um, that's got to be a uh, we're currently in a partnership with four other counties where we um, see the Cogs actually been spearheading it where we've all put a million dollars in you'll see the infrastructure starting in Moreland Moreland Township I believe is the first one within the next uh, couple months that they're going to start breaking ground in that area um, we've been told by the state that there's another package coming through that would be um, broadband monies specifically for that because you're absolutely correct that that if anything's been identified through COVID is the need for broadband even on a lot, much larger scale. So and I think that. we have to realize that there will be additional monies and you know uh, the state and federal government is one of their top priorities mm -hmm. so we'd rather let them use their money versus there are scarce separate, resources. <laughs> separate allocations just like there were to the counties mm -hmm for broadband. Yeah. Yeah. So, so having said that though, because actually when we talked about this early on, I was going to make the comment later on. We have to make sure we're going to get those funds because if we don't bring broadband to every part of this county, we won't have any economic development. I mean, people will not, it's like electricity in 1935 or 1940. They're just not going to come here. They're not going to come here. They're not going to buy houses. I'll be honest with you, I moved to Hepburn Township. If I had recognized the difficulty we had up there, where we don't, we only have DSL. So we, we're definitely looking at it, but I think we need to nail it down. There are counties you brought back from CCAP, the county, uh, Green County, made a modest investment yeah. of a million bucks and were able to, to uh, build... Um, uh, Green County has done a marvelous job in two years out there. We're we'll actually be, I think it's the same date, April 12th, I think we meet with them all. Yeah. yeah. And we're going to be talking to those commissioners out there. And they built out uh, not just broadband. They built out um, hot fiber optic cable, right. and it was pretty reasonable. So yeah, yeah, we we definitely need to look at that. And Comcast, I 
think if you saw in the newspaper, they just were awarded a grant uh, to help them expand some of their systems in the southwestern side of the county, I think it would be. Yeah. yeah. Right. The, the project with CEDACOG, while it's great and we're happy that we're doing it, it's going to affect a very small number of businesses, sure. 63 businesses. And that's what it was designed to do. It was a pilot program and it was designed three years ago when we didn't have some of the information we have now and so forth. But anyway, just to... It's on our I'm sure in the whole scheme of things, too, you're trying to use the money the best that you can to help uh, either develop the area, grow the area, but also help the taxpayers going forward and uh, you know the the judicial system uh, I'm sure there's been major changes and I haven't really seen a lot about that but I would think that the the uh, use of uh, remote for sentencing and hearings and that kind of, has that been a bigger yeah, we, we've thing actually met within the day we're talking today about technology and they they have their um, Polycon system, they're, they have three now, they do hearings from the prison on a regular basis, and uh, they've been utilizing technology the best they can through this whole pandemic. Uh, possibly uh, uh, helping uh, River Valley, I don't, I don't, I have no affiliation with them, but I just think that they've been a, a River Valley uh, Health and Dental, mm -hmm. um, to help them strengthen uh, their system because I think they've really been available during this pandemic and 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 maybe uh, you know especially in the area of helping seniors uh, you know get quick attention and get quick results when there have been issues uh, there um, you know, when they talk about uh, frontline workers I think of the staff at places like that you know the nurses and the staff that are there uh, that if there's any way to, to help them, uh, that would be good. I, the other thing is, and I, I'm, I don't know, but if RMS, um, you know, if they're, I would think because of the pandemic, maybe the tonnage was down or not, maybe their their sales were down or maybe it went the other yeah, way. Yeah, it went the other way. Went the other way because everybody's home. Everybody's home, home. Okay. home remodeling and throwing stuff out. It went really well. Or maybe they're doing profit. Well, the, the thing that, that I was thinking about is if you could use any of that money maybe to help them buy at the transfer station the, the, the property to the west of them, just a tail end piece there that would help the transfer station. My recollection was that Director York's always wanted a little bit more of a footprint there so he could carry out their, their uh, job a little bit better. But, um, it's a good idea. Uh, and the, the county HR, I mean, I read and hear of the issues you are encountering with the lack of uh, people, and I'm sure you're looking at it, but if there's a way to use the funding to help see if you can shuffle the jobs around, uh, pay people more, keep the head count down, um, you know, and keep the legacy costs uh, going out uh, and and I guess finally the children and youth uh, I don't know you know what's going on there but I would have to think they probably encountered a lot of uh, tough times during uh, uh, during this period and and maybe some money can be helped us to uh, or used to help the uh, children and youth and um, through the pandemic I believe that you're going to see uh, uh, mental health really increase mental health crisis has increased, you're going to see a rise in addiction, uh, you're going to see numbers that are going to probably go through the roof, unfortunately, uh, as a result of the pandemic, people being in their homes, uh, cases of abuse, unfortunately those are the sad, sad effects of this pandemic also that are going to be uh, pronounced in the next few years. One one more thing is uh, I, the uh, senior the senior community um, from what I've heard, the Meals and Wheels people that went out to, to deliver uh, meals during this time period were s some of the only people that, that the seniors that are shut in had a chance to see. And I don't know if there's any way you can you know, work with STEP to possibly 
uh, you know, they, I think, should be considered a frontline worker uh, or, you know, <coughs> that uh, went above and beyond to help in that community during that time. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Thank you. Anyone else? I'd like to thank you for attending and, and hearing your, your, your stories because, you know, um, you are right. It is about economic development, you know, with uh, our city and the arts. Uh, Habitat is a great program. And I see Tim back there who is uh, instrumental, uh, as I recall, and uh, he's also a comedian, but... <laughs> but uh, Yes, and we've we've seen it work, and and that's what's impressive. Um, we have very limited resources. When we're talking about twenty two million dollars, I know my colleagues just can't wait to give it out. Mm -hmm. Neither can I, uh, but we have to do it wisely. And um, you know, everyone made a very strong argument today for your position, and you know, um, I'm sure we can do something. Uh, We'll just put it all together. Our planning department has done a fantastic job so far. Uh, and Cedar Cog uh, has done a great job for us as well. Cog, they're here tonight to answer any questions. They they drove up just just to answer any questions and listen. And and they've been uh, great partners through through all this uh, uh, trying to decide how we can do what, what how we can do it, and whether uh, make sure that it all passes the, the mustard when it. It's audited, so. You know, Commissioner, I think what was uh, truly important about the <clears throat> um, information that you provided to us is I think it will help us further define our evaluation criteria going forward. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of these things are linked. And very, and it's very much, yeah. Very difficult to just throw that out in two or three slides for you. Are there other people that wanted to speak, Tim? I didn't know if you wanted to speak. I, I do have to leave. So. Yeah, that's okay. Tim, so I'd like to hear you. Make sure you tell a joke about him while he's talking. <laughs> <laughs> Contrary to other comments, this is a pretty serious proje project here we're talking about. Yes, yes. very much. Uh, but let me just talk about my experience has been 38 years in jail. And I got out, I retired, and I discovered that health, hunger, and housing are big areas. And I'm trying to piece different things in my, my 48 hours a week that I can apply to it. First of all, the nonprofits try to catch those who fall between the cracks. And it's key. I've had contact with the nonprofits all through my career now. It's just they do a lot. And you can't solve all their problems. But the fact that you did the survey and you got this input from all these nonprofits, you need to catch that information. And you need to get those nonprofits to understand that they're not in silos. Because what they solve in one thing, we've got the social determinants of health. Those things that impact on health, but they also impact every one of those individual things. So we need to bring everyone aboard on that. You saw Raise the Region. Look at the response of the people just to help those nonprofits. And of course, there's always the federal things and state that have little. Uh, little tie-ins that they have to do at the same time if they got the message to take and, and with this data that you have about what were some of those specific my particular pre-application is minuscule to or what you all saw there but at the same time is uh, in my particular coalition we're 28 years old we're involved with nurse family partnership we're involved with River Valley and we do things with the youth development task force that you know about but it's just that little segment that we say we're part of the whole community because we need to keep the kids here. We do the safe kids with corner by, by preventing injuries because we want them here safe. Tim, you should tell the public. This is being live streamed to the public. Tell them the name of the organization. And, and well, which one? Well, <laughs> on, you're talking about a live well, check, I assume. Well, right? I'm, I'm volunteer coordinator for the uh, Lycoming County Health Improvement Coalition. Right. It's a 501c3. It started in 1994. Started with uh, the, the doctors saying we need something to help people prevent injuries <coughs> and to be healthier. I have 38 people on the board uh, from all different sectors of life. And we meet, uh, we've been meeting uh, 
via Zoom. We continue to talk what we have to do, but we also, a lot of our, inform our contact is person to person, and, and we've not been able to do that. But we've been able to have a couple of our, our, our task force just to be able to do things in the community uh, via Zoom and however we can get the information out. Uh, that's very our, our role. But I'm also involved with mental health, the NAMI, uh, like Coming Housing Development Corporation. Uh, those are groups too that just try to address a particular aspect of life and to just get people to be better. And uh, that's what we had to do. I, um, I admire the work you're doing. I think it's great, but I think we don't. We should not lose that concept of okay, yeah, we did this survey back in 2022, but we want you to know as a group of of, of uh, nonprofits, these are what the people are saying. And guess what? You're all kind of saying the same thing, and we need to tie each other together. Thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Thank you. And just so you know, we do try to do a lot of that tie-in by working with staff working with CEDACOG. Um, CEDACOG actually also does our community development block grant funding administration. So they work with a lot of, uh, of entities to do that. Uh, Jenny Pachano, our lead planner, she works with um, CEDACOG on the CDBG program, but she also, we do a fair every year. Mm -hmm. And we are one of the top five counties in accessing fair funds, which is housing funds um, that come out of back, out of the uh, Marcel Shale, and Jenny handles that program every year. <coughs> we do outreach to all these these entities so that we can try to spread that knowledge and also access to those funds. So anything that you can give us that would give us better ideas towards coordinating is is great. Jenny, you have anything you want to add? <laughs> Did we get anything online? No, I don't have any. Okay, anything at all? <coughs> okay. nope. Well, thank you everyone for attending. Um, as you can see, this is an exciting project. There's a lot going on in the county that's, that's tremendous. I believe that uh, our county's going in the right direction. It's, it's growing and um, exciting what's going on in the city in different parts of the county, but there are some enormous projects out there that, that we have to tackle and, and uh, look forward to helping who we can help. So have Thank a great you. evening. Thank you for attending. Thank you. Thank you.